Hello everyone, today we will start uh, mock rooms for knowledge and pathology section. Okay, we will start now very soon. And I need you to understand that the pathology stations reduced from two to one. So you have only one pathology station in your exam. Okay, so again, pathology stations reduced from two to one. So it is very, very easy right now to pass pathology. By the way, pathology is the most forgettable part in MRCS OSCE. So it is fine for you in October, July, August to find it only one station. Last exam about skin lesions, it was about malignant melanoma and uh, it was very easy for you and it is, is the same as the notes. And as I told you before, what is important is not to keep uh, a lot of study, but to keep the answer for each question in one minute at a maximum. So try to abbreviate all answers to all specific questions of any station. Like when I say malignant melanoma, you can study it from Cardiff course, from uh, any other courses, all are fine, the same material are, are used, but the method with you is to have a specific answer. Like you can write ambus malignant melanoma and read from there. You can write uh, malignant melanoma on any textbook to search and read it from there. But to try to maximize the summary for each answer, for each question to be only one minute. This is a trick that we pass with. Okay, so station one today is about steroids. And I will start with any you who, uh, any one of you who studied steroids. So it is about steroids. Anyone is ready with us to Isra? Are you ready? I told you last time to study, and I hope you uh, have studied some pathology to answer with me. So pathology stations in your exam is only one. So it's better to be with us today if you want. Isra, if you are ready, and Wells, Yanista, Suarob, Wells, Yanista, Suarob, Shahadat, Isra, Dafer, anyone raising his hand? Okay, thank you, Mr. Dafer. Anyone raise Didi, Zuzu, can you raise your hand after Mr. Dafer? Arofia. Yes, Mr. Dafer, how are you? I'm fine, Doctor. Sorry, I, Doctor Reda, I am prepared for October. Excellent. So I give the uh, chance for January people, uh, uh, doctor, to uh, to answer if they don't have any volunteer. I'm ready. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank you for understanding. Anyone is ready for July? Anyone is ready from July exam course candidates? Please let us know. Easy, Paul, Wells. Swarup, Shahadat, Mr. Iqbal, today is a mock, so it is live. So you should raise your hand, you should be very interactive, but no problem at all, I will wait for you. Mr. Daffer, a 68 year old woman, past medical history of polymyalgia rheumatica, some migraine presents with, uh, uh, presents uh, taking high dose steroids to treat her giant cell arthritis. So this lady, seems to have some polymyalgia rheumatica, migraine, and she is on uh, high dose steroids to treat her giant cell arthritis or temporal uh, arthritis. And you know, there is association be between polymyalgia rheumatica and uh, giant cell arthritis. So if I asked you about what is the definition of steroids, can you let us know, please? I unmuted you, Mr. Daffer, again. So if you define steroids, Sam or Daffer? Yeah, hello, Sam. Hi, sir. Hi, Sam. Uh, have you booked your exam for July or October? My exam is on 5th July. July, okay. So what, what is the definition of steroids if, if you have studied some pathology? So, uh, your weakness yes, in I... anatomy, 
and I'm going to review this with you again and again, but about pathology. Have you studied something for pathology? Yes. Excellent. So what is steroid you have mentioned in ASSC notes? Yeah. So what is the definition of steroid? So a steroid is an organic compound with uh, four cyto uh, al 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 alkane rings. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Which is arranged in a very specific way. Okay. So organic compounds that are, that are containing characteristic arrangement of four cycloalkylene rings that are joined together. So what is the layers of the adrenal cortex? The uh, layers of adrenal cortex are uh, four in total. Uh, one is uh, three zones, uh, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona uh, reticula, uh, reticularis, and then so, the uh, medulla of the, uh, sorry? So GFR, glomerulosa, GFR. fasciculata, and reticularis. Oh. So what about the, uh, what glomerulosa secretes? So glomerulosa secretes aldosterone. And fasciculata? Uh, steroids uh, like uh, cortisol. cortisol. Okay, and reticularis. Uh, reticularis, sex hormones, testosterone, and uh, estrogen. Okay, and do you know what is the secretion of the medulla? Uh, medulla secretes catecholamine. Catecholamines, excellent. Okay, so this is the adrenal uh, medulla secreting the uh, catecholamines. Adrenaline and noradrenaline, and this is the cortex. This is the cortex. The outer side is GFR fasciculata. GFR means glomerulosa fasciculata reticularis. ASD, aldosterone steroids, and DHEA, which is dihydro, uh, aldosterone. And the, this uh, glomerulosa secretes mineral corticoids, aldosterone, fasciculata secretes glucocorticoids, cortisol and reticular secrete dihydroepi aldosterone, which is representing the sex hormones androgens. Okay, excellent. And what is the aldosterone or mineralocorticoid action of the aldosterone? Sir, uh, mineralocorticoid uh, is responsible for salt and water retention, and it also plays a role in metabolic al uh, alkalosis. Okay. And so, uh, then, potassium excretion. So the aldosterone is edematous hypertensive hormone. Means that it will lead to salt water retention and potassium excretion in this circumvoluted tubule and collecting ducts. And the water balance by this salt water retention, it is the controllable of water, uh, of, uh, water balance. And do you know whether the aldosterone is controlled from the pituitary or higher centers or no? The question is, is aldosterone under control of the pituitary or no? Anyone answer on the chat? Anyone answer on the chat? I think it should be yes. No, it is not. Okay. No, it is not. Okay, it's not under control of the of the uh, of the pituitary. Okay, and don't forget that the secretion of potassium got a rule in as base balance causing metabolic alkalosis. Okay, okay. About the other questions for the steroid. Why this lady is on steroids? What do you think? Why this lady is on steroids? Do you know? And will, will she need any steroid cover perioperatively? If she's undergoing any surgery, would, would she requires, would she require any perioperative steroid cover or no? Sam? Sam, the mic. Sir, yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. So what is the question? Why is this why lady? This lady why, why, so what do you think that, about why this lady 
is on steroids and sir, whether you will need any steroid cover peri op sir uh, as per uh, her history uh, steroids have been given to uh, provide an you uh, know anti immunosuppressive effect uh, and if we suddenly stop steroid steroids then she will go into adisonian crisis so to prevent the adisonian crisis as long as she has been on at least 10 mg prednisolone per day within the last 3 months then she will require a perioperative steroid cover so this lady might be on steroids because of the giant uh, cell arthritis and the polymyalgia rheumatica and this lady if she's perioperatively she will require perioperative uh, steroid cover why to prevent the adisonian crisis and when she will require it when she on at least 10 mg prednisolone per day within the last 3 months if she if she's taking less than 10 mg then she will not require steroid cover and if this was 3 months ago or more then she will not require a steroid cover and will have a very nice uh, uh, schedule for the steroid, perioperative steroid cover. What is the Edisonian crisis? Do you know? So, Daphne, uh, to open the mic for you to help Sam to make it competitive, as, as if you are an oral exam and I'm representing uh, any examiner and you are representing uh, two uh, oral uh, examinee at the same time. So what is the Edisonian crisis, Sam? Do so you know? Sudden uh, sudden uh, loss of uh, systemic supply of circulating steroids. Uh, which is, it to... is it loss? Or it is just insufficient required? Insufficiency. So insufficiency it's in circulating steroids. So it is acute reduction or acute uh, decrease of the circulating steroids, endogenous circulating steroids. What is the reason for this? So it can be either primary or secondary. Uh, primary is a, a deficiency of steroids. Secondary can be because of uh, trauma. Uh, it can be because of surgery. Uh, trauma, surgery, infection. infection and stopping it, supply. It, yeah. The most common cause is exogenous steroid use as in this lady, which is suddenly stopped rather than being tapered off. Okay, can you draw the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis? If I told you to, to draw any gland hypothalamic pituitary axis for any gland, you will, try, you will draw a cir circle and write hypothalamus and draw another circle and write pituitary and write a third circle and write the gland okay. adrenal. Adrenal. And for the adrenal, what is the hormone will come from hypothalamus for the adrenal first? Sorry. ACTH. Adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH. ACTH will stimulate pituitary to secrete what? Uh, cortisol. No, pituitary. Pituitary gland. Pituitary gland. What the pituitary will secrete by the... Sir, pituitary will secrete ACT. Excellent. So coming back to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus, what will secrete? CRH? Yeah, yes. CRH. Okay. So again, the hypothalamus will secrete corticotrophic hormone. Okay. Or corticotrophic releasing hormone. This will go to the anterior pituitary exactly because what the posterior pituitary will secrete? Do you know what is the secretion of the posterior pituitary, hormone. oxytocin, and the ADH only. Two hormones by the posterior and rest by anterior. The posterior will secrete oxytocin and ADH. AD for uh, dog or donkey or delta. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and the oxytocin by the posterior. So it is anterior pituitary, will secrete ACTH. And then the ACTH will go to the adrenal cortex, will 
will uh, stimulate her to secrete uh, cortisol. And please note, once this secrete, secreted will negatively uh, affect the two superior glands, anterior pituitary and hypothalamus. So you will write two lines from cortisol to inhibit anterior pituitary. To stop her from, he will say, I'm with the cortisol, I'm already secreted. So please anterior pituitary, can you stop releasing ACTH? Anterior pituitary will tell him, yes, you inhibited me. But again, please let the hypothalamus know by inhibiting the CRH will, which will dig into my head to secrete the ACTH. So the cortisol will tell the anterior pituitary and tell hypothalamus to please calm down. And uh, the metabolic effects as well will, uh, will inhibit uh, the metabolic effects will happen and any stress uh, will stimulate the hypothalamus directly. Okay. So any gland, the, the final result will inhibit the above superior glands. Okay. So don't forget the acute reduction of circulating steroids, primary and secondary. Primary, it is called Edsonian disease. It's primary by the gland hypofunction. Secondary trauma infection surgery, and the most common cause is exogenous steroid use. Okay, about steroid cover. The perioperative steroid cover, as I told you, the patient will need a steroid cover as long as uh, she is on 10 milligram or above for three months or above, recent three months. But if the patient stopped the steroids, more than three months ago, then you will assume a normal hypothalamic pituitary axis and no perioperative steroid cover is required. If below 10 milligram as well, you will assume normal hypothalamic pituitary cover and you will give no perioperative steroid cover. Do you understand, all of you? Do you yes. understand this point? But if the patient is taking 10 milligram per day within the last months. Now we need a steroid cover. According to the surgery, minor, moderate, major. Minor surgery, this color will need 25, 25 milligram hydrocortisone at induction of the surgery. And then you will resume the normal medication that was pre-op. You will continue it post-operatively as, as was before. If moderate surgery, you will use uh, uh, usual dose of steroid preoperatively, and, ze and then you will give 25 milligram of hydrocortisone IV at induction, followed by 25 milligram IV, eight hourly for 24 hours. So TDS for the next perioperative, postoperative day. And then after this day, you will continue the preoperative dose afterwards. If major surgery, you will, it is the same for mod moderate, but you will uh, use this 20, uh, 25 milligram for 48 to uh, 36 hours, for two to uh, 72 hours. So for one, for two to three days, okay? So this one is like this, 448, 48 to 72 hours. So is this as per NICE guidelines? Sorry? Is this as per NICE guidelines? This is, uh, if you write on the Google, uh, NICE guidelines, perioperative steroid cover, you will find nearly the same as this one. Yes, I, I take it from the NICE guidelines. Okay. If that's okay with you, you can go to Google and Google it and put it for because us. I, I was operating on a patient who was on steroids and uh, American Association came up with new guidelines 
which uh, says that you have to give 100 milligram hydrocortisone on induction, then 200 milligram 24 hour in, uh, uh, infusion. Yes. Or 15 every milligram course, every six if hours. you will hear the previous uh, course lecture, there was a discussion about this. And we okay. said that I think like like this on the on the post, it was from nice guidelines and I sent it as BDF. So I will send it again from the uh, UK guidelines, not the American one. I know there is 100 he here. Some people write it like, as you told me, 100 milligram, and then you will continue the same written, but this is from uh, the NICE guidelines and I will share it afterwards. But I think it will be more equivalent to each other, okay? But this is not being asked before. He will, he will only require this question, you know, this one. To okay. prevent the Edisonian crisis. And you will tell him 10 milligram and three months. <coughs> but this is, I will share it for you on, on, uh, on the group as well. Patient two, can you read for us, please? A 43-year-old old man presented to his, to his primary care physician for pigmented lesion on his right forearm. He has, he has had multiple sub um, burn in the past and work as a farmer. He's spending most of the day outside. Physical examination is noted, notable for a 7 millimeter uh, hyperpigmented lesion that is asymmetrical uh, with irregular border and color variation. He undergo an excisional biopsy, which demonstrated larger than the normal inanocyte with variable various size with the large hyperchromatic nuclei in the lower epidermis and dermis. Excellent. So this is a session two. What is the definition of melanoma? This seems to be malignant melanoma for me. And I'm asking you, what is the definition of melanoma? Melanoma, it is a malignant tumor arise mostly from the skin, from the epithelial cell that secrete melanocytes. Melanocytes. Site is a cell and melano is a mel melanin, yes. so it is melanocytes. The most, af most commonly affected site is? The most commonly affected site is the skin, but it is can affect the other for nasal cavity, it gets intestinal, cornea, uvula. You mentioned that. And what about the genes responsible for familial malignant melanoma? CDKN2A and CDK and another MC1R. And this is the, just the three one, and I know which. Okay, so please mention BRAF gene. BRAF, BRAF gene, yeah. BRAF gene, CDKN2A, CDK4, MC1R, and ARCA1, True. and P53. Please remember that uh, the BRAF gene is very important because there are some mutational studies for the BRAF gene okay. and some treatment, emerging treatment for the BRAF gene. I will let you know later on. Mm. Characteristics would increase the suspension of melanoma for you as an examiner. So it is the, from the from the from the uh, question, we look at irregular irregular border, sun exposure as it occurs in the sun exposure area, irregular, uh, uh, mixed color. Okay. So. Extend so the asymmetry mm. of the pigmented skin lesion, the border irregularity, and the color variation through the lesion being hyperpigmented in some areas, hyperpigmented white, or brown, or dark brown, mm. and that which is more six millimeter and evolution over time. So these characteristics of the ABCDE rule that will increase our suspicion of a malignant melanoma. Do you know what is the risk factors for a melanoma? 
malignant melanoma? <laughs> risk factor, risk factor for melanoma. It is genetic. Started from the genetics and exposure, uh, immune compromise, exposure to the CT scan in the uh, radiology form with the CT scan in the uh, early childhood, uh, and also immune compromise. Excellent. Also, this plastic nevi, multiple nevi, and ultraviolet radiation, mm. fair skin color, and immune suppression, and use of scan, multiple use, and the misuse as well. What are the main types of cutaneous melanoma? I mean, uh, I'm either superficial or nodal or acral, or uh, this is the most common type. Another type, it is this is plastic melanoma, melanoplastic melanoma, ocular melanoma. Ocular melanoma as well. Okay, and do you know what are rare types of melanoma? Yes, I said uh, the, the last three one is the rare ocular melanoplastic melanoma and this is plastic melanoma. Okay. So and the, the superficial spreading is the most common one and seen in some exposed areas. Mm -hmm. And it is flat, irregular in color and shape. And the one, no, not not. one is seen in men and uh, associated with ulcerations and bad prognosis. Acral, most commonly seen in Asian and patients from African descent and usually found on palms, soles, or under fingers. Fingernails, so fingernails, palms, and soles. Lentigumarigna freckles, this is called the invasive melanoma, and usually uh, it is common in the face, neck, arms, and usually it is invasive. But also it is not of the uh, bad prognosis as nodular and acral, so superficial, most common and most favorable prognosis, lentum arigna freckles, not that bad prognosis as acral and nodular, which are bad prognosis. Other rare types are uh, ODA, ocular, dysmoplastic, and amelanotic. There is a new question asked about uh, what type of melanoma with spindle cells? Yeah, so the melanoma, it's two types. It is either epithelioid or spindle type, spindle cell type. But yeah? Yes, but I forget that. So far. <laughs> About spindle, do you know any melanoma with spindle cells? I don't, I forget that, sorry. I remember about that, but I forget. No. So you can you can remember that desmoplastic is an ophelic melanoma, and yeah. also the read term uh, reads pigmented spindle cell nevus, which is often misdiagnosed as malignant melanoma. Reads pigmented spindle cell nevus. Okay. This is a new question. So I will add it on the group for you because it's been okay. up uh, before. And I will add it to the OSCE group. With the perioperative, I will add this right now. This has been asked. Okay. So what is a Breslau thickness and why it is important? It is very important for determining the uh, grade or it's great for the mirror normal. It is measurement from the upper surface of the melanoma to the deepest part. Okay. What is uh, the importance? So it's it's important, important to, uh, to determine the grade of uh, melanoma. So which is important? The Breslau thickness or Clark's? It is, uh, I think this is two, uh, both of them is important, but this is birth law, it is more than. Breslau is uh, most prognostic yes. and more prognostic than Clark's, and it is the measurement uh, 
of from the top of the granular layer of the epidermis to the deepest point of the invasion. And it's used as a prognostic indicator okay. and guide excision margins. These are from uh, NICE guidelines about the Breslau depth of invasion and what will you uh, do for surgical wide uh, excision with a safety margin. So the safety margin will be determined by the Breslau depth. So if you have initial stage zero, which is carcinoma in situ or the confined to the epidermis, you will have to do initial safety margin of 0.5 centimeter and will examine the margins. Below one millimeter depth, you will have one centimeter safety margin between one, one to two millimeter, one centimeter margin between two to four and above four millimeter, you will have two centimeter uh, safety margin. Some people will ask that this is a different in a lot of books and stuff. Okay, but it is uh, it is variable even on the up to date 2020 and the 20 uh, and the nice guidelines like this. Okay. Okay. Okay, but I recommend also from the NICE guidelines 2015 the, the regarding the malignant melanoma, just, just read this ones. Consider excision with a clinical margin of at least 0.5 centimeter for people with a stage zero melanoma. If an adequate histological margin is not achieved after excision for stage zero melanoma, discuss further with the MDT. Offer excision with a clinical margin of at least one centimeter for people with a stage one, which is a Breslau thickness less than two millimeter melanoma. Offer excision with a clinical safety margin of at least two centimeter for people with a stage two uh, melanoma, which is Breslau thickness two millimeter or more melanoma. Measure vitamin D levels at diagnosis in all people with melanoma and give whose vitamin D levels are thought to be suboptimal for vitamin D supplementation and monitoring in line with local policies and NICE's guidelines. Just read them. What is the main treatment of the melanoma, Dr. Taffer? Do you know? The, the main, the main uh, line for treatment is either surgical, destructive, topical, and systematic. For surgical, either surgical excision with the safe margin, as we said previously, or with a flap, and on the, or, or micro micrographic or uh, surgery microscopic surgery to determine the good excision and also destructive it is left for example cryosurgery or uh, cryosurgery uh, for in topical high uh, fluorescence and photodynamic and systematic for example chemotherapy Excellent. I accept this, but let's do it very abbreviated. Yeah. And this is a newly emerging drugs. The medical yeah. answer, medical, Vimeo Rafinib. Vimeo Rafinib okay. is a BRAF kinase inhibitor that can be considered in patients with metastatic or unresectable melanoma with a BRAF V600E mutations, because I told you there is BRAF mutational studies this is emerging a BRAF a mutational studies for the familial melanoma and typically given with cobimitinib, which is biological agent. Surgical local wide excision and, in, and this is the mainstay of treatment for primary cutaneous melanoma and the wide local excision will be according to the Breslau thickness. Okay. When would you do sentinel lymph node biopsy for malignant melanoma? Do you know? If there is, uh, for example, if there is a lymph node enlargement or suspected it is related to the metastasis, or and, it is more than. And when else? If it is more than, it is more than. Uh, one CM or one CM? No, I don't know. 
Okay, I always recommend that you should always be revising the pathology. It is one of the most forget forgettable parts because mm. you know it is really forgettable and you you can forget it on any time as long as you will not study. So I do always recommend that you always revise the pathology and anatomy. Anatomy because some relations, some questions related to some nerves like that. But uh, otherwise, we will forget everything. Okay, so mm -hmm. so again, at the time of the local excision, patients with thick melanomas, presence of one of more than one malignant melanoma, and consider in melanomas with adverse features like severe ulcerations, lymphovascular infusion, and high mitotic rate. Okay, who makes up? the malignant melanoma MDT, who yeah. is there it's, it's, in the MDT. Okay. That's the end of the Okay, the pathologist, the dermatologist, the plastic surgeon. Plastic surgeon. You need some others, like clinical oncologist, clinical oh, yeah. specialist, and psychologist to treat the, uh, if, if it will be, uh, like, you know, there is severe excision for a, 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 a sensitive region for a female, this will be very catastrophic for females. So, uh, and for us as well, for males as well, they need psychological support. So you need, you need to remove this lesion. You need uh, the surgeon, the primary surgeon, the dermatologist, the plastic surgeon, if you need a- Lab or something there, yeah, okay. Pathologist and oncologist to give you the uh, decision, the pathology report and the management of this report accordingly. And you need a nurse and psychologist. Okay, thank you, doctor. I hope you enjoy studying anatomy. It is only one, one station. Okay, Didi Zuzu Isra Wells Yanista Wells Afulabi. Chris, please, it is eight stations or nine stations today. So we need, we, all of us, we need to be there. Today is a level up from anatomy to pathology. So you need to be there. So for this 42-year-old uh, bare skinned woman is con uh, concerned about a pink barely mole on her cheek as per her description. And as per her description, she has no significant past medical history or anything, but reveals that she regularly goes to tanning salons and uh, beach. And she admits that she occasionally forgets to apply screen, sunscreen and uh, do not reapply when she's outside all the day. So this is a legion, as you see, and we need you to describe uh, this legion. Can you? Okay, it's a res, uh, erase, red, uh, pearly, erase, it's res, it's red, and, um, or serrating, with a pearly shape appearance or something. So what in your mind when you describe any lesion according, is it a lump or ulcer? Or if you see it is a ulcer, then you will describe like, oh, side size shape, surrounding. Okay, so side size shape, color, surrounding, and presence of any other swellings around like lymph nodes. Okay, so this is a pink, fairly white, almost translucent do dome shaped nodule or papule overlying telangiectasias and the size uh, around two centimeter per one and a half centimeter and commonly uh, there is raised rolled edges and this lesion if I will continue to describe it as basal cell carcinoma I will tell it might ulcerate and bleed and the crust in the center and form a non-healing ulcer and frequently 
it will be present as you described on this female on some exposed areas. Why the surrounding skin is red? Do you know? The surrounding skin is red due to the presence of dilated uh, uh, vessels. So do you know the vessels and inflammatory changes around? And do you know if what is your differential for this lesion on this lady's female cheek? Okay, uh, it could be a squamous carcinoma. It could be uh, a tuberculous ulcer. Then uh, it can also be maybe uh, a venous and uh, uh, actinic keratosis. So squamous cell carcinoma, tuberculosis, or actinic keratosis. Okay, so it is locally invasive malignancy. There are two types of malignancy, either benign or malignant, or locally malignant in between. Locally malignant means that it is malignant because it will invade the, invade the basement membrane, but it is locally, so it will never metastasize or very limited potential to metastasize. Okay, the classification, uh, for the basal cell carcinoma, very rarely asked, and it is localized, superficial, or infiltrative, localized like nodular, nodulocystic, or pigmented, and superficial from uh, like superficial spreading and multifocal, and infiltrative like morpheoform and morphoic. But this has never been asked. This is from doctor exam book. What are the clinical features of basal cell carcinoma? As you said, the site of uh, sun exposure, like head and neck, especially on a line drawn from the angle of the mouth to triggers of the ear, and the appearance may be variable, and the nodular is the most common subtype. Okay. What is the treatment options for basal cell carcinoma? Do you know? Okay, the treatment option for basal cell carcinoma would be the non-invasive or invasive, uh, non-invasive involve the use of a topical agent, uh, use of uh, mainly topical agent, a uh, 5 fluo uracil cream, and then uh, topical minoquinol cream. And also, it can also be invasive where uh, surgical excision are done, either by uh, excision and primary closure or graft or flap closure can also be by curettage and uh, electrodesiccation, uh, cryotherapy, and also by more technique, uh, micrographic uh, And lastly, radiotherapy can also be an option. Okay, as I told you options for a treatment for any disease, you told you should tell me the determining factors. So these options are, the deter are determined by size, location, and histology, and cosmotic consideration for the lesion. These are the treatment options determining factors. And then the options will be electrodesiccation and the curettage for non-facial tumors that are small or superficial. Okay, not used for aggressive tumors. The cure rate up to 92%. But this curettage and electrodesiccation is non-facial and superficial tumors. Wide local excision, 90% cure rate, and then the most micrographic surgery, and especially if uh, high risk or cosmetically sensitive areas like the face or if recurrence. So MOS or micrographic surgery will be used for recurrent or cosmetically sensitive uh, and high risk. High risk, cosmetically sensitive recurrent lesions. And the cure rate of this one is 99%. 99%. Okay, very treatment, very nice treatment what? options and very briefly written. Sorry? What of uh, local was the indication? Local what? For wide local what was the indication? What, what again? Can you ask it for wide local surgical excision? 
causing the question. It is usually for basal cell carcinoma, you will use electro curettage and electro desiccation and the curettage options. And wide local excision is an option, but there is no clear indication here written. But okay. again, if you have options of electro desiccation and the curettage, this is if non facial lesion. If you have then a facial lesion, so you have two options wide local, wide local surgical excision, and then doing a local flab or medical deflab or free, whatever. And then you should have another option. If you haven't most micrographic surgery, for sensitive areas, then a second option is wide local excision. But if you told the examiner that these options of basal cell carcinoma treatment are determined by site size, histology, and cosmetic considerations, we have the most commonly used electrodesication and the curettage, and a, a cure rate up to 90 or 92 percent. But this is for non-facial lesions. For non -faci for facial lesions and sensitive areas, we have wide local excision and MOS, which is for high risk recurrent and sensitive areas and cure rate up to 99% for MOS micro micrographic surgery. This would be enough for me. Skin graft plays for the patient after wide local excision, but there is a graft failure. What do you think the most common reason for this graft, in, in fact, in graft failure? Most likely due to MRSA. And it is due to wound infection. The most common organism causing this wound infection is Staphylococcus aureus of the skin. Do you know any pre malignant lesions for squamous cell carcinoma? Any characteristics, bowen disease, and picoplica? Again, I, I hear when for squamous cell carcinoma because in any station we can make it variable, like men syndrome and few chromocytoma. I am in men syndrome, but I, I will ask you what is men syndrome types, then you will mention few chromocytoma. Then the examiner will take you from there to introduce you what is few chromocytoma. What, what do you think the reason for the, this or the presentation for few chromocytoma? So actinic keratosis, Bounds disease, it is in situ squamous cell carcinoma, and leukoclechia, which is white batches on the oral mucosal surfaces. And 15% of it will progress to squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue or the cheek from inside. What is the difference between squamous cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma? Uh, based on the, the cells they arise from. Melanoma arise from a melanocyte. Why the squamous cell carcinoma arise from uh, epithelial cells? Uh, melanoma develop in a uh, younger age, while the older age are uh, affected by uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, melanoma melanoma metastasizes. Uh, uh, met melanoma has a better prognosis than uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and um, also. Uh, Melanoma is uh, pigmented, so sometimes can be non-pigmented, but uh, squamous cell carcinoma is uh, not uh, pigmented. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma affect uh, more of uh, the skin exposed part of the part of the skin, like the face head and neck. Excellent. So you can select from the beginning. Etiology needs intermittent sun exposure and and site anywhere in the body, but this is will be uh, will be uh, needs uh, continuous sun exposure and will arise in sun exposed areas. That's why, and the shape of the lesion. This is a fleshy, ulcerating, infiltrating lesion, but the melanoma is pigmented patch, a brownish or a, a dark brownish, and then the. The, the treatment methods of squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma and the incidence, incidence and the uh, metastasis and the prognosis. Incidence more common in melanoma, metastasis less common, thank God, and better prognosis. Okay, but the squamous cell carcinoma, thank God, also less common. 
okay? But metastasis is common with poorer prognosis. You can do it like sentences, not to forget them. And this is another, another picture for you to differentiate between the basal, the squamous, and the uh, melanoma. Okay, the MOS. What is the definition of MOS or micrograph? Hello? Yeah, what is the definition of MOS? Okay, MOS is a, a laboratory, pathologic laboratory procedure that is used for rapid uh, microscopic tissue diagnosis. And what is the value? What will be taken first and then what after? So you should clarify that this is serial tangential horizontal sections are taken one followed another and examined one followed another histologically until all margins are clear. So it is micrographic surgery, yes, done by, sur by taking surgical, serial tangential horizontal sections from the skin and taken fo one followed by one and examined one followed by one histologically until all margins are clear. So you will excise this part like this, then you will examine it. If the margins are clear, that's okay. And then you will take other one until taking the last one from this until being clear margins. Okay. Section three, anyone is here to answer with us? Thank you so much, Chris. You are very active and I hope you be very active in your study. It is not for you to just study only the book and that's it, but also try to extend your knowledge and try to be very, very good about uh, most of the stuff in any question asked in any stage. But these are the curriculum of MRC is hosted. Dr. Amr Hassan, Dr. Easy Paul, Sam again, Siddharthi Shankar, Wells, I need you to be with me to start station three. Thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah, here you are. A 42-year-old Pakistani lady presented with neck lumps in the anterior triangle of the neck. Uh, she's back from foreign travel, complaining of loss of weight and night sweating. What is oh. differential diagnosis? Uh, differential diagnosis in this case can be, uh, my first differential diagnosis would be tuberculosis and other differential diagnosis would be uh, lymphoma. Uh, or uh, uh, which is either Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's or sarcoidosis. Uh, useful tests for diagnosis of tuberculosis, uh, Montox test, uh, uh, Quantiferon, sputum examination, and uh, PCR. Uh, we can also do FNAC of the uh, lump the, in the anterior triangle of the neck. So can you hear me? Continue, yes, continue. Yes. What is granuloma? Granuloma is a collection of uh, giant cells. Uh, types of examples of giant cells can be uh, reed Steinberg cells or uh, I don't remember the other one. Mm. Langerhand giant cells. Okay, so what is your differ differential for this neck lump? You told me tuberculosis, what else? So Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, sarcoidosis. Okay, and uh, whether uh, for a neck lump, what is the most common cause for neck lump? Being a lymph node. Yes, lymph node. Yeah, so lymph node, so you don't forget this one. So 
what is the transmission of the tuberculosis? If we will consider this case tuberculosis, what is the airborne spread? Uh, the sorry, droplet what? spread from airborne. Airborne spread of a droplet nuclei from patients with infectious tuberculosis. And what is the uh, risk factors? Sir, malnourished patients, uh, exposure to patients who have tuberculosis, which means traveling uh, to and from uh, uh, endemic areas of tuberculosis, patients uh, who traveling are immunocompromised. Traveling to endemic areas like Central African Republic. What is uh, like the tests used? You said you uh, you said tuberculin. That's fine, but first first is sputum fast. test, early morning sample. Yeah, which is will be with acid fast on zeal Nelson staining. Okay. Yes. Tuberculin test. What is the type of hypersensitivity in tuberculin test? The type four hypersensitivity. The tuberculosis itself is type four, but the, tu the tuberculin test. The antibody mediated. Cell mediated. Sorry, cell mediated. So tuberculin is type of hypersensitivity. So it is a type, it is type four as well. As long as I told you it is cell mediated, it's type four as the tuberculosis itself. It is delayed type and it is cell mediated. Okay, what is uh, the pathogenesis of the tuberculosis? Do you know? So tuberculosis uh, bacteria, once it invades into the uh, uh, respiratory cells in the lymph node, it forms a gone focus, which elicits a local reaction, uh, causing uh, migration of cytokines and neutrophils, uh, which uh, later on uh, develop into, uh, which, and these macrophages later on develop into uh, giant uh, cells. So we have primary TB and secondary TB. The primary, as you told, first it is droplet infection from infected person, cough, then uh, the bacteria will, the mycobacterium tuberculosis will reach the alveoli and then the alveolar macrophages will be recruited and eventually will cause granuloma by these macrophages to fuse together to form uh, giant cells. And this fused macrophages will known as uh, giant cell and the granuloma will be formed and will be dormant until secondary TB occur when the patient immune system is weakened, especially in being immunocompromised medications, malignancy, malnutrition, or newly acquired HIV infection. Okay, and then the secondary TB will happen. The manifestations, we said night sweating, fever, hemoptysis, cough, malaise, and all of that, right? Okay, so what is the imaging of a choice for tuberculosis? So plain chest radiograph, PAV. About the presentation, we have uh, a talk about the presentation and that's fine. What is the imaging for the this lady? Do you know? The plain X-ray chest. This X-ray. This is the initial evaluation of TB. Okay. What are you expecting? Any findings do you expect if this lady is a positive for TB? So, uh, gone focus. Yeah. Uh, bilateral. It is. Uh, very hilar lymph node involved with very uh, lubar gons focus in the apex or in the uh, base and very hilar lymph node involvement, cavitary lesion, upper or middle lobe infiltrative and middle or lower lobe infiltrative lesion will suggest primary infection and the upper lobe, 
upper loop infiltrative lesion will suggest latent TB reactivation. Why the apex uh, will be affected? Because the apex will have higher oxygen tension and reduced perfusion and lymph node co clearance compared to the base. This is the upper lobe, uh, why it will be suggestive of latent TB reactivation. The studies, as you told me, sputum acid fast uh, testing will demonstrate the acid fast bacilli. Real-time nucleic acid amplification, this will rapidly confirm the TB and is considered the first line diagnostic study. Tuberculin test, this is the most widely used to screen for latent TB infection. And as I told you, or as you told me, it is type for delayed uh, hypersensitivity reaction against purified protein derivative, PBD. And the size of the induration is associated, is assessed after 48 to 72 hours. And please note that the patients who received the BCG or Bacil Calmet Gurin vaccination will have false positive results. And false negative can be seen in immunocompromised patients. What is the interpretation? The positive results mean then mean that you have more than 15 millimeter uh, in patients with no risk factors or 10 or more millimeter in patients with risk factors like healthcare workers traveling to endemic areas or being in prison or immunocompromised. And don't forget interferon gamma release assay, and this will measure the interferon levels released by the patient immune system in response to be uh, against the TB antigens. What is the treatment of the TB? So medical, like rifampine, isoniazide, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. This is for the active pulmonary TB infection for four months. After four months, the treatment involves isoniazide and rifampine. So isoniazide can cause peripheral neuropathy as well as sideroplastic anemia. Don't forget this. Isoniazide monotherapy, this only indicated as a prophylactic treatment for latent primary TB after active TB has been excluded. What is the complications of TB? Do you know the complications of TB? Complications? Of disseminated disease. POTS disease of the spine. POTS spine and the genitourinary tuberculosis. So abscess. If affected the pericarditis or meningitis, tuberculous meningitis. Tuberculous so meningitis is a cause of that. Or the CNS. Okay. The granuloma definition is aggregation of epithelioid histiocytes. And it is named like this because it's arranged in clusters and it will be reduced, or it will be produced by the uh, fused macrophages and the caseous necrosis that will happen in granulomas like the uh, tuberculosis. Do you know what types of granuloma, you know? What types of granuloma? The reed Steinberg cells and Langerhans giant cell. No, types of granuloma, no, it is a different question. Types of granuloma, granulomatous disease types. No, Anyone knows? Classification of granulomatous disease, chronic granulomatous disease classification. Any one of you knows? It is being asked before the types of granulomatous diseases. I will ask another question until you know this one. Do you know uh, two types of non-epithelioid, uh, non-caseating granuloma? Two types of non-caseating granuloma. Anyone answer in the chat? 
allow participants to uh, non deviating Hodgkin's lymphoma, sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease, Crohn's leprosy, and Crohn's and sarcoidosis. Okay. Okay, regarding types of granulomatous disease. Do you know? No, sir. It's been asked many times. Okay, you can you can define it as non-caseating and caseating. Caseating due to presence of central necrotic zone like TB or fungal infection. Non-caseating like sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease, Vigener's granulomatosis, and Bartonella or scratch disease, cat scratch disease. Any other classification of chronic granulomatous diseases? Infective and non-infective. Okay, this is in pathology. You forget these ones, but for granulomas, you should know that there is known etiology and unknown etiology, infective versus non-infective, caseating versus non-caseating. And the histologic types, epithelioid, histiocytic, sarcoidoid, tuberculous granuloma, and rheumatoid granuloma even. So you should be oriented about, I will put a picture for you on the group to be oriented because it's been asked. And there is another exam question being asked this time, okay, about the stages of acute inflammation. The stages of acute inflammation, anyone knows? Anyone knows? I post this one on the group. Anyone knows a stages of acute inflammation? The vascular phase and cellular phase. Vascular phase is when there is local vasodilatation and uh, production of chemical mediators with exudation of fluid and the cellular phase will be uh, recruitment of uh, neutrophils which uh, uh, happen by margination and rolling uh, and uh, get attached to the endothelial surface uh, and go to the chemoattractants in the cell. So fluid exudation due to endothelial injury, the capillary venule permeability will increase, vasodilatation will happen. So, fluid exudation. Then, leukocyte activation by immigration, chemotaxis, and phagocytosis, uh, and then engulfment and killing of the bacteria. And then, you have to know these steps. And as you told me, it can be divided into vascular permeability and cellular phase, or vascular phase and cellular phase. What is the outcome? Restoration of normal structure, granulation tissue formation, which is highly vascularized and fibrotic uh, tissue, or abscess formation, or fistula formation, or scarring. Okay, so all of these are pathology questions. Types of giant cells, Reed Sternberg cell, okay, of Hodgkin lymphoma, foreign body. Giant cell, Langehans giant cell, and the other two types, histiocytic and Teuton, uh, which is a ring of central nuclei, like you see here. Okay, thank you so much. Afulabi, uh, thank you, Sam, thank you so much. Amr Hassan, Dafer. Amr Hassan. Wells, Afulabi, Sam, Yanista.
Okay, three participants raised their hand. Chris, again, yes, Amr. Good. Hello, Dr. Rida. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Amr. Wa alaikum, same. A 53 year old lady presented with the breast lump. Uh, can you comment on this pathology report? Uh, if I ask you another question, how would you comment on a pathology report? How would you comment on any pathology report? What is the content of the report? And okay, then, it must include the, the histological type and the so grade, first, the tumor. First, three things. First, you have to mention three subjects the patient, the doctor, and the specimen. The patient, correct details, date of birth, name, age, indication, and everything like that. And then the doctor, uh, uh, job description and stuff like that. And number three is the specimen. And then the specimen, we are going to talk about the type of the specimen and the side of the specimen and the nature of the specimen. What else? Then you will talk about gross features, microscopic features, and the probable diagnosis. OK? Yes. So it is breast lump in the notes. It is available. And I'm asking about what is here to do. Human, it, it, it stands for a human epidermal receptor. Excellent. Uh, which is which is expressed uh, in some types of uh, breast cancers. Yes. So what is the what is the function of guide management? Yeah. What is the function of being, or, or what is the value of being here too positive? The value that it, it guides management uh, for the possibility of usage of. Uh, of uh, target therapy, yeah. uh, which is called Herceptin. Okay, excellent. So the incidence is one in five. One in five breast cancers, the cancer cells will contain uh, this gene. And being HER2 positive, this will manage us to give her some uh, Herceptin. What is Herceptin? Uh, receptor is a type of uh, target uh, 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 anti-monoclonal therapy uh, against uh, HER2 new positive. And what what is what is the form? It is what is the name of this drug? It is called uh, astazumab, and it is part of the chemotherapy regimen for HER2 new a positive lady. Okay. Okay, this is the Herceptin. Do you know some of the side effects of the Herceptin? And, and what is the action of Herceptin? It, you said it is uh, controlling the growth of cancer cells that contain high amounts of human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. So it is function for controlling growth and repair. What is the side effects of this Herceptin? Diarrhea, headache, nausea, fever. Diarrhea, headache, nausea, and fever. Do you know what is the definition of tumor suppressor genes? Tumor suppressor gene. Tumor suppressor genes. Yes. The, the genes that uh, inhibit or suppress the process of oncogenesis. So you have to graduate me for proto-oncogenes and then yes. being oncogenes. So proto-oncogenes are normal genes, help the cells yes. grow. And when this proto-oncogene mutates or overexpressed, there will be a bad gene called proto-oncogene, which will promote the uh, tumor growth, OK? The tumor suppressor, uh, pro suppressor genes are also normal genes as proto-oncogenes, but these genes 
will control and slow down the cell division and will repair any mistakes in the DNA and will direct some cells for apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. When tumor, cell, tumor genes are mutated or not expressed, then there will be a cancer. So what is the, different, the, the difference between oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes is the oncogenes result from activation or turning on the proto-oncogenes. But the tumor suppressor genes cause cancer when they are inactivated or turned off. Okay, this is the definition, all definitions. Herceptin, as we told, one in each female with a breast and stomach cancers are HER2 positive. <clears throat> and Herceptin can help control the growth of cancer cells that contain high amounts of human epidermal growth factor receptor 2. And HER2 can be found in all human cells and it controls cell growth and repair. This is what is written on all websites. You can just keep two sentences for the examiner. Okay, but you need to study pathology very actively, Mr. Ahm, because it is only one station. So you need to hit this station fully to pass. And by the way, as we told in the beginning of the stations, you are easy to pass in, in pathology. You have only one station. And the overall pass is not for knowledge and the skills separately. It is for the whole exam. So I think all the whole exam will be come together as pass, general pass or general fail. So it is your time to pass. And it is very lucky if you do it in this COVID era because uh, you have reduced the state, no patients, no stress examining, no steps and doing the examination and stuff like that. So I think it's a good, uh, good chance for you to pass, Mr. Ali. Okay, station five, Miss. Thank you, Ham. Continue studying. Next time in critical care, there will be very nice questions, but I need you to finish them. Are you for October or July, Mr. Ahmed Hassan? For October, inshallah. October, inshallah. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Afulabi. Mr. Afulabi. Mr. Afulabi, yes. Yes. Hello. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, man post parathyroidectomy presenting with vague abdominal pain and CT showed pancreatic mass. What what is your diagnosis for this? Are we thinking of uh, insulinoma? Being part of what? Being part of a uh, multiple endocrine syndrome type one. Multiple endocrine neoplasias. Okay. Type one. What is the types of what is main syndrome first? Main syndrome is a, 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 a symptom complex comprising of uh, multiple endocrine uh, tumors coming together in the patients. It could be type one. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. It could be type one. It could be type one, type two A, and type two B. Excellent. That's fine. So multiple endocrine neoplasia, it is defining itself. So it is multiple cancer syndrome with yes. uh, multiple endocrine cancers. All men syndromes have autosomal dominant inheritance. Please keep this with with you. MEN1 gene located on chromosome 11 and RET gene located on chromosome 10. The epidemiology and the prevalence is that MEN1 is more common than MEN2, that's why it's called 1. And the prognosis dependent on the MEN type, which is 
which neoplasia occur in individual patient. Main one called Vermeer syndrome, Vermeer syndrome or Vermeer syndrome. Main one gene mutation and it is presence of two or three of the piece. Again, main one gene mutation and it's called Vermeer syndrome it is, and it is a presence of two of the three of the following, PPP, parathyroid tumor, pituitary tumors, pancreatic islet cell tumor or endocrine tumors. Parathyroid increased parathormone will cause hypercalcemia, will result in, for example, moans, groans, stones, kidney stones, stuff like that. Pituitary tumors like prolactinoma or growth hormone increase. Pancreatic islet cell tumor like zollinger elson syndrome causing gastric ulcers because this is uh, HCL secreting because it is gastrin, gastrinoma or zollinger elson will secrete gastrin that will increase the secretion of HCL. Insulinoma, so insulin will be higher, glucose will be low, and hypoglycemia. Or vipomas, part of watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, and acrohydra syndrome, called Wadha syndrome. Wadha syndrome is watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, acrohydria syndrome and don't forget glucagonomas. So pancreatic eye cell tumor is gastrinoma, insulinoma, vipoma, and the glucagonoma. This is main one. So two of the Bs. Main syndrome divided into main 2A and main 2B. The common features is medullary thyroid carcinoma and few chromocytoma, and both of them associated with red proto-oncogene mutation. Main 2A called sepal syndrome. So medullary thyroid carcinoma will secrete calcitonin, few chromocytoma bowels of hypertension, and parathyroid tumors. Main 2B, medullary thyroid carcinoma, few chromocytoma, but not parathyroid tumors or parathyroid, uh, hyperparathyroidism. It is oral and intestinal ganglioneuromatosis, like osteomas and stuff like this. And don't forget association with morphanoid body habitus. Main one, don't forget flank pain due to kidney stones, abdominal pain and dark stools due to gastric ulcers, watery diarrhea, because you don't forget Wadha syndrome. Wadha, WD, watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, acrohydria syndrome, which is vipoma. Main two, neck pain, dysphagia, hoarseness due to thyroid mass, episodic headache, palpitations, and anxiety due to few chromocytoma. The physical exam of MEN1 is costovertebral angle tenderness and abdominal tenderness. MEN2, hypertension, tachycardia, neck masses, or palpable thyroid nodule and cervical lymphadenopathy. Imaging, MRI or CT of the abdomen, symptoms consistent with few chromocytoma, and you can find adrenal gland mass. Ultrasound neck for patients with dysphagia or hoarseness to find thyroid nodule. The studies, TSH levels, serum calcitonin levels, free serum metanephrine level elevated in few chromocytoma, followed at the follow-up with 24-hour urine collection. Serum parathormone and calcium levels, serum glucose levels due to elevated in glucagonoma and the low in insulinoma. Serum glucagon level, serum insulin level, and C-peptide levels, serum gastrin level in hypergastrinemia due to gastrinoma, which is called zollinger elson syndrome. The treatment as per disease. For zollinger elson PPI, 
like omeprazole or lansoprazole or surgical like thyroidectomy for midarily thyroid cancer, total thyroidectomy, followed by thyroid hormone replacement, parathyroidectomy and parathyroid tumor of MEN1 syndrome, if it's cancer, which is less than 1%, and duodenal pancreatic surgery according to the pancreatic tumor and adrenalectomy infused cremous cytoma. And please put the preoperative medications to prevent hypertensive crisis. Must start with alpha blockers and follow up with beta blockers. And don't forget the complete bilateral adrenalectomy is recommended to reduce risk of recurrence. Okay, this is a station five. Any one of you knows what is hyperplasia, what is hypertrophy, what is atrophy? Any one of you? Afulabi? Yeah. Hyperplasia is the increase in the number of cells. Excellent. So hypertrophy is increase in the size of cells and atrophy is a reduction in the size. Excellent. So atrophy decrease in size, hyperplasia number increase, hypertrophy size increase. What about dysplasia? Meta change of the type of the cell. What about dysplasia? What is the definition of dysplasia? Dysplasia. Anyone in July and does not know what is the definition of the dysplasia? Is disordered cellular development may be accompanied with hyperplasia or metaplasia? Characterized by pleomorphism, nuclear hyperchromatasia, and high mitotic figures and loss of polarity. And this may develop, this dysplasia may develop to cancer because the severe dysplasia is known as carcinoma in situ. Please keep these definitions, okay? What is the example of hypertrophy? Anyone knows? I will allow you to mute yourself to make it open discussion. Anyone knows what is the Example of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy of the muscle due to uh, exercise. Excellent. This is physiological, physiological hypertrophy. What else about hypertrophy? There is a physiological type, Dr. Rida. Yes, uh, that occurs in heart, like LVH. Left ventricular hypertrophy. Excellent. This is due to long standing hypertension. Excellent. Did you two the breast hypertrophy during pregnancy or lactation? Muscles thickening due to and this will lead to decrease in the chamber chambers of the heart. This okay. What about metaplasia? Can you give me example of metaplasia? Smokers. Two. In the part of esophagus, Dr. Rida, that uh, it turns into adenocurt. Adeno. So it is called, uh, you mean? Yes. Uh, the metaplasia dysplasia sequence Coimus. in colorectal cancer. Excellent. So one minute. So first, you talked about the gastrointestinal reflex disease. Mm -hmm. To lumbar metaplasia, the lower esophageal uh, epithelium will change from stratified to lumbar. Then the resultant will be adenocarcinoma on top of this columnar uh, metaplasia in various esophagitis. Give me example of severe. <laughs> Do 
Give you a name. Is it like, like, you know, cervical, mm. intra, intra cervical neoplasia? Six, anyone can open the mic and have the full. I muted Sam. You can have the station if Afulabi is not available. So, female presented with thyroid nodule and raised calcitonin. Uh, what is your differential diagnosis? My first differential diagnosis, given that she has a nodule with a raised calcitonin, would be medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. Uh, what is the origin of the lump? Medullary carcinoma originates from parafollicular C cells. Okay, that's fine. But what condition do you need to rule out before surgical intervention? Uh, because medullary carcinoma of thyroid is known to be associated with uh, uh, characteristic uh, syndrome of uh, MEN, uh, which has associated neuroendocrine tumors, for example, uh, in the pancreas or in the adrenal gland. Uh, in the pancreas, I would like to rule out an insulinoma, or I would rule. I, I would like to rule out Zollinger Ellison syndrome, and in the adrenal gland, I would like to uh, rule out a pheochromocytoma. Excellent. Uh, the diagnostic test I would like to use for this condition would be uh, calcitonin itself. Uh, if the patient undergoes surgery and a total thyroidectomy, in this case, because it's a medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, I would be more inclined. Uh, to perform a total uh, thyroidectomy with a radical lymph node dissection. And uh, later on, to assess for any recurrence of disease, uh, we can use uh, uh, calcitonin as a marker. The other diagnostic investigations that I would like to do would be as part of preoperative investigations, uh, which would be uh, routine blood tests. Uh, and I would also uh, consider for uh, imaging to rule out insulinoma and pheochromocytoma either with a CT. Uh, what is a PET CT? Uh, PET CT is a specialized form of CT which involves the use of uh, markers or uh, assays, for example, FDG or 5-FDG or uh, other markers that can be used are uh, choline uh, PET. And uh, what FDG PET does is uh, because tumor, uh, because cancer cells have a high metabolic rate, there will be uh, an increased metabolic demand and uh, this will be picked up on the uh, PET CT. Hence, it can be seen uh, uh, as uh, a distant, uh, as possibility of distant met or uh, mets which were previously unidentified. This is superimposed over a CT scan to identify the location of the cell. So it is called positron emission tomography. It is imaging test that will help reveal how your tissues and the organs are functioning or chemically active. It will be using radioactive drug, which is called tracer, to show the activity of organs. And this scan can detect diseases before it shows up on other imaging. So it is so sensitive. The tracer may be injected, swallowed, inhaled, depending on which organ do you want to show. The tracer collects uh, in areas of your body that have the higher levels of chemical activity. And then will correspond to areas of the disease. So the bright spots on the PET CT will be shown as very chemically active areas. It will be useful in revealing and evaluating several conditions, like many cancers, heart diseases, and some brain disorders. And some uh, radiographers will use PET imaging in combination with CT or MRI to create special views. So for the cancer, it will detect the cancer, reveal whether it is 
uh, going to like metastatic or spread and check whether the cancer treatment is working. So follow up for treatment and find out whether the cancer is recurrent. Okay, Basically, so we can say, sir, for occult metastasis. Yes, for heart diseases, will reveal areas of decreased blood flow in the heart and can help you in finding whether you will benefit from a procedure to open uh, heart arteries like angioplasty or coronary artery bypass surgery. For brain disorders, can use to evaluate center brain disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease or seizures and some tumors as well. Okay, station number seven, parotid lungs and general questions as well. And st station seven is the last one. Please, next time for the people with the July exam should all attend, please. Please, you should all attend. Otherwise, we are uploading lectures, we are doing something live or not live. It is very important. I can show you live lectures on Zoom which are recorded, but I will not do this. I'm trying to be present for July and the surprise for October that we will be extra staff members of the team to be live all over the October course. Not Zoom recorded shown as live ones, but it is live. We appreciate all other courses. They are better than us and they are excellent and, and, and. But a lot of people fail with us and with others because of no study. So I know lots of people in our courses and other courses and have studied. We appreciate all, but the key with you, not with us. The method with us, I trust this. The method again with us, but you need to study. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed and uh, good luck. So and last question. Yeah, of course. You know, when examiner is asking questions in the station and when you're giving them answers, does it have to be like exact pinpoint answers or just make them understand what we understand? He is, he is not, he is not uh, one like uh, mechanical engineer. He is a surgeon and he is evaluating your answer. But should reach the reasonable level of the correct answer. And then he will say, yes, that's fine. Next. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. OK, so again, you can reach the, the answer in about one minute and you finish all the stations, but most of the examiners are very kind. He will stop you and tell you, okay, and uh, excellent, but what else and what do you know about this? And can you clarify the answer in another formula? So he is helping you that your answer is not fully correct. And another examiners, when you start saying the correct answer, but you extend the answer, you try to say four sentences and he already reached his sentence, most of the examiner will tell you, that's fine. I will ask you the next question. Okay, hope you enjoy it. And I hope you uh, always be uh, fine studying to pass and finish this story of MRCs. Good luck.